those of you who've not, not been to one of these things before will not know that not know me. My name is Chris Baker. I am one of the conveners conveners of the Virtual Heritage Group of the Black Country Society. Uh, the other two people who are convening and assisting are Andrew Homer, whom we'll meet later, and George McFadden, who's doing all the recording and that sort of thing. The Black Country Society Virtual Heritage Group was set up as an experiment in February and we're running five sessions uh, to see what sort of response we get. It's aimed at people, society members who live away from the Black Country, uh, society non-members, and also to some degree society members who find it difficult to get out of the house. Uh, so it meets a variety of needs. And we've done a variety of things over the last three meetings, um, uh, but today we've reverted to a, a standard talk format. Um, you'll find if you go onto the website, uh, there are links to the recordings of the previous three meetings, or there will be come nine o'clock this evening when the third one goes live. Um, and uh, so do take a look at those and see what we've done before. Uh, mm -hmm. But I'd like particularly to welcome those of you who haven't been here before, and I hope you enjoy the evening. As ever with things such as this, we are continually experimenting, continually expecting the technology to go wrong. So far it hasn't been too bad. We do have a bit of a glitch this evening in that uh, when the speaker tries to speak and show his slides from his computer, then everything freezes. Uh, so I'll be showing the slides from my end uh, while the speaker speaks. Uh, the only irritation there, of course, is he'll have to keep saying next, next, and that sort of thing. But I hope that won't get in your way too much. Um, the normal rules apply, please, if you could, most of the time, uh, keep yourself on Zoom, on chat, oh, sorry, on mute. What am I talking about? Um, uh, we'll have a, if you've got any questions, could you put them in the chat function, please? And Andrew will read these out at the end and we'll see what answers we get. Uh, and we might ask you to actually put the question yourself if you wish to. Um, some of you signed up very late indeed. I realize I have got another two people in my inbox uh, waiting to be let in. So I'll have to do that shortly and try to get the slides moving at the same time. So we'll see what sort of success I have with that. Um, um, but thank you for coming. The speaker tonight is Jack Price. Uh, Jack is the Society Membership Secretary, and I'll read what he says about himself on the Society website. Will and all born and now Bilston bound, Jack grew proud of his black country roots whilst at university and has since harboured an unquenchable thirst to learn more about it. His main interest in the life is, is in the life, times and work of Francis Brett Young. His particular focus is upon the representation of war and pollution in his novels, themes that heavily dominate his fictional representation of the black country. When Jack's not trying to learn about our fantastic region, he's usually either in a pub enjoying a nice pint or listening to the tones of Roy Orbison, Elton John and Johnny Cash, which goes to show we can't all be perfect, can we? Um, 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 uh, so I will try and share screen and hand <coughs> over to Jack. If Jack has to tell me once or twice to move on, that's because I'm trying to register these latecomers who've just appeared. Uh, but I'll I'll try and do that as as quickly as I can. But as I say, I will now share screen. Um, The delay was because I was about to share the screen at about the fifth slide. <laughs> now. Uh, Jack, could you say when you can 
That's all good. We can see Chris. So thank you very much, Chris. And good evening, everybody. Um, I hope you can hear me all okay. If there are any issues with it, just shout up and let me know. But now, thank you all for joining me um, tonight on this journey into the soot and smoke of Francis Brett Young's Black Country, a world gone but for many of us within the Black Country Society and elsewhere. It is a world that is not forgotten. A world which undoubtedly has shaped how many of us continue to view the region and influences our understandings of history, both on a smaller black country focused scale, but also on a much more wide sweeping one. I'll begin with the quote, that dismal zone of country, perhaps Brett Young's most succinct description of the black country. By no means the most detailed and certainly not the longest, we nonetheless, in those five words, immediately get a strong sense of what Brett Young thought of the industrial region. It is a taste of disgust, it hints at disappointment, and it is immediately telling. I take it from the Iron Age, his first black country novel of 12, written during the years of the First World War and published in 1916. Tonight, I will analyze and interrogate Brett Young's depiction of the black country, his native, if not preferred region, which I must emphasize, and I will also look into his portrait of the area, bringing it into alignment with the actual black country and investigating how his own understanding, opinions and prejudices informed it. If you could change slide for me, Chris. So when I joined the Black Country Living Museum last September, I was both pleased but also disappointed to learn that one of their historic characters over the summer holidays had been Francis Brett Young. The disappointment, of course, stems from the fact that I had missed playing him, but alas, at least I played him and that is the important part. Naturally, I asked some of my new colleagues about how they found playing Francis Brett Young, but unfortunately, they reported that he was quite the flop. None of the guests knew who he was, and the individuals portraying him had barely heard of him beforehand, which I don't hold against them. This small example is testament to many conversations I've had ever since studying and working on Brett Young. Francis Brett who, they all say. Well, I reply, and a very brief biography is always in order. The story of Francis Brett Young begins in Hales Owen on the 29th of June, 1884. It was here in what he later referred to as the debatable zone between the black of industry and the green of nature that he was born. The son of Thomas Brett Young, a doctor in the town, he harboured hopes of studying at Oxford and becoming a poet. His father wanted him to follow in his own footsteps, however, so he was sent to the newly founded University of Birmingham to study medicine in 1901, graduating in 1907. He immediately went abroad and visited the Far East, but upon his return to Britain, he married the love of his life, Jesse Hankinson, and after some locum positions, took up as a general practitioner in the seaside town of Brixton in Devon. During the First World War, he served in the Royal Ambulance Marine, I'm sorry, Royal Ambulance Medical Corps in German East Africa, where he served under General Jan Christian Smuts. Amongst the thick mosquito-laden bush of Africa, he wrote numerous poems. A memoir of the war, entitled Marching on Tanga, which Rudyard Kipling proclaimed to be one of the three best novels and books to have come out of the war. And he also strung together the plots of several novels. His first, Undergrowth, written in conjunction with his brother Eric, had emerged in 1913. But from 1915, he was publishing regularly. Fame had been a long time coming, however, but it properly arrived in 1927, following the publication of Portrait of Claire, which also received the James Tate Black Memorial Prize. Change slide. Throughout the 1930s, Francis Brett Young was one of the foremost novelists of his day. Testaments to this were given by several contemporaries. When asked his opinions of the younger writers of his day, the poet laureate, John Maysfield, declared, Francis Brett Young is the most gifted, most interesting mind among the younger men writing English. As a poet, and as a writer of fiction, he stands in a place of his own, acknowledged by his fellow craftsmen and soon to be hailed by the world. If you could change, in February 1933, the Daily Mail heralded Brett Young as the only English writer 
who could be considered a worthy successor to John Goldsworthy, and announced that, in face of all his natural gifts, most of his contemporaries will soon be forced to hail him as a literary giant. Finally, some of the greatest compliments ever received by Brett Young were made by one of his most eminent contemporaries, his fellow man of Worcestershire and free time Conservative Prime Minister Stanley Baldwin. If I may say so, the Premier wrote from 10 Downing, 10 Downing Street, there are one or two things about your books that give me complete satisfaction, your craftsmanship and your capacity to give the smell and the spirit of the choicest country in the world. A greater idea of Brett Young's predominance can be gained from two sources. The first is a set of cigarette cards released by Wills, Britain's leading tobacco company in 1937. It is a set of 40 prestigious writers. The second for source is Donald Brooks Writers Gallery, which provides short biographies of 25 of the central writers at the height of the Second World War and, where appropriate, expresses their opinions on the war itself and the period of reconstruction that will have to follow it. Francis Brett Young is included in both of these sources and always last, but that is on account of the fact his surname is Young and not on his perceived merit. Here we have a selection of those writers who feature alongside him. And if we start in the top right, we have P.G. Wodehouse, the humorist best known for his inim inimitable Jeeves and Worcester stories and carrying on round clockwise. We then have Sheila K. Smith, a best-selling author whose books pivoted around Sussex and Kent. Vera Britton, the pacifist whose memoir, Testament of Youth, was deeply, deeply influential, do forgive me, during the interwar years. George Bernard Shaw, one of the last eminent Victorians whose plays touched upon some of the greatest issues of his long life. G.K. Chesterton, the creator of Father Brown, a rival of Sherlock Holmes whose opium was religion and not the actual drug. A.A. Milne, a playwright who is best known today for the world of Winnie the Pooh, created for the benefit of his son, Christopher Robin. J.B. Priestley, up in the top left, one of the greatest social critics and playwrights of his day. H.G. Wells, the other last great remnant of the Victorian age, a pioneer in science fiction and a keen observer who well predicted the devastation of total war. And finally, we have Hugh Walpole and next to him Compton Mackenzie, both best-selling novelists and both personal friends of Francis Brett Young. That Brett Young is listed in the ranks among these authors, some more forgotten today, others admittedly still household names, is an indicator of the mark that this black countryman made. So this begs the question, what, what happened? Francis Brett Young is not the only writer from these sources who have been forgotten for one reason or another, but we are now dealing with a man who was clearly good at his craft and acknowledged as such. Why did he become a mere footnote in the history of literature? Is it perhaps too tempting to claim he set himself up for a fall in describing the industrial detritus of the black country in Birmingham, regions he and many of his contemporaries viewed with disdain and contempt? This is perhaps the key to it. If you could change slide for me, Chris. Francis Brett Young was not the only writer to have spilt ink on the black country. Daniel Defoe, William Shenston, James Woodhouse, James Keir, Mary Martha Sherwood, and Roderick Murkison all commented on the black country during the 18th and early 19th centuries. Next. Charles Dickens, the great Victorian novelist, had written in his region, had written of the region, sorry, in his novel The Old Curiosity Shop. And it featured in the novel Sybil by Benjamin Disraeli, later Conservative Prime Minister. Against this literary background, James Naismith, Samuel Sidney, and Walter White all wrote of the region and its industry, all three giving a good idea of the indiscriminate chokehold it had over both nature and man. David Christie Murray, born in West Bromwich, also wrote several novels that were set in his native region, but soon moved to his more preferred climes of Cannock Chase and Southern Staffordshire. In Brett Young's own time, J.B. Priestley commented on the black country in his social commentary on the condition of Britain during the Great Depression. And the region has since had a central role in the works of such individuals as Archie Hill, our editor Emma Pursehouse, 
Safnam Sangira and Kuli Kole. Now, some of these authors are much more complimentary about the black country than others, especially the more recent and living ones. There is perhaps a reason for this. Ever since the 1960s, civic pride in the black country has gone from strength to strength with the formation of this very society in 1967, the establishment of the Black Country Living Museum during the 1970s, the designation of a Black Country History Day located in June, and of course the creation of the region's own flag. Critiques still remain, but they are more social and not so much focused on the actual topographical makeup of the region. Before the 1960s, however, the Black Country was almost always denigrated on account of the fact it was a virtual hellscape, the modern day equivalent of Hades. This comes at no surprise, given that it was the most heavily concentrated industrial region in Great Britain, mined for its great mineral wealth and sprouting up on the back of these numerous foundries, furnaces, factories and chimneys that filled the skies above it with soot and smoke, the most likely reason, of course, for the name we now know it by. We get an idea as to how this region looked, not only from the words written by some, but also from art. Next slide. Oh, it's already there. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> Especially that of J.M.W. Turner and Wolverhampton's very own Edwin Butler Bayliss. It perhaps comes as no surprise that the rising pride in the black country coincided with the deindustrialization of the area and the closure in 1968 of Baggeridge Colliery. Before this, the sooty pallor of the region, the burnt landscape and stunted nature that occupied it, the horrendous working conditions and the almost uncivilised population all seemed to invite criticisms and criticisms it received. Having been born in 1884 and dying in 1954, Francis Brett Young joined the established canon of black country critics, its industrial, its industrial zenith and steady in decline being witnessed by him first hand during his very earliest years. This is perhaps, above all, why he is forgotten. Not only was he writing about a region that did not receive good favour generally, but also because there was little place for his criticisms in the age of black country pride. To truly see the importance of Francis Brett Young's portrait of the region, however, we need to actually turn to it and begin interrogating the depiction Brett Young's black country is more developed than that, than that of his literary forebears and contemporaries, being much more detailed and consistent. In Dickens's Old Curiosity Shop, for example, the journey of little Nell Trent and her grandfather through the black country serves as little more than a development in the plot. In Brett Young's novels, however, it is the driving force behind numerous plots, and it is so developed that I would argue it is amongst the most significant of his characters, the other main players, of course, being Birmingham, the countryside of Worcestershire and the Welsh marches to the west of the Black Country, and to a lesser but certainly not any, or any more unimportant extent, South Africa. It is the characters of the landscape that dominate Brett Young's works, and the actions and fortunes of his human characters are all dependent on the landscape against which they are set. But Brett Young's Black Country, though having more meat on its bones than other depictions of the region, is not a carbon copy of the actual black country. It has been altered and changed, so it better fits his plots and his purpose. The name of the towns he features are altered, a practice adopted by Thomas Hardy and Arnold Bennett before him. This not only allows Brett Young to make the towns his own and to more easily allow for creative license, but it is also incredibly convenient allowing him to easily get out of any accusations of slander. Some towns are quite like their real inspiration, with only certain elements changed, whereas others are more composite towns, inspired by a number of locales to give a more general idea of the region's characteristics. Jax Leclerc states that the real black country is made up of around 20 towns, which is something I'll leave up for debate, but all of them are close in location and each significantly different and fiercely aware of it. Brett Young's Black Country, on the other hand, is made up of just eight towns, 
And so let us meet them briefly before digging deeper. So on the left hand side there, we have the modern black country split into the four metropolitan boroughs of Warsaw, Sandwell, Dudley and Wolverhampton. Brett Young's black country, on the other hand, is much more limited in obvious scope. Next slide, please. Sorry, Chris. <coughs> the most important topographical features of Brett Young's black country are his fictional version of what were, arguably, the most important topographical feature of his life, the Clent Hills. Penn Beacon stands in for Clent Hill, whereas Uffdown represents Walton Hill. Further north is the River Stower, poisoned and almost devoid of life. Brett Young's own childhood town of Hales Owen is rehashed as Halesby, whilst Horn, formerly a town in its own right, but now part of Hales Owen, is, becomes Morn. Stowerton is more or less Stower Bridge, whereas Stowerford, to the southeast, is located, as Francis Brett Young writes, on the site of Lord Cobham's Hagley Hall. Cold Harbour is another ancestral home, and it stands where Wazzle Grove, a stone's throw from Stowerbridge is located today. Travelling north and deeper into the heart of the actual black country, we find Dulston, recognisable as Dudley due to its castle ruins. We also have his own version of Sedgley, christened Sedgebury, which stands up high on the Sedgebury Ridge and is home to the Sedgebury Main Colliery, later known, as we will explain, as Fabulous Bairn. Finally, there is Wensford, which, though located roughly in the same location of Wensbury and taking inspiration from that same town in its name, Brett Young declared was a composite black country town. And there's also Wolverbury, which he admitted was not quite Wolverhampton. Next slide, please, Chris. This is a limited portrait of the black country then, as Brett Young appears to ignore what is the modern borough of Warsaw and almost entirely that of Sandwell. But, as we will later discuss, the eastern side of the Black Country does make its mark felt. Regardless, Brett Young is still one of the most wide-reaching depictions of the Black Country that we have in literature. And, that, and the fact it is quite limited, and certainly composite, a more or less affair, that is the very key to its success. It is a more general picture than a true-to-life portrait, giving Brett Young's readers a sweeping but still telling idea of what the landscape of the region and life within it was really like. Change screen. If we start focusing on the individual towns that Brett Young introduces in his novels, it is only right that we should first turn to Halesby, for it was the counterpart of the novelist's birthplace, Hales Owen. Michael Raven notes that Hales Owen had as geographical friends the Clent Hills, which lie about a mile to the south of the town. It is significant that this fact has been picked up by other commentators, for Brett Young was, from a very early age, aware of this natural gem located on the very doorstep of his childhood home. Hales Owen was, in the late 19th century, on the very cusp of the black country. On one side lay the desolation and spoil caused by industrialization. On the other spread the beautiful vistas of Worcestershire in all their glory, and the Clent Hills were the gateway to this natural magnificence. As a child, Brett Young would often walk or cycle up the Clents with his mother in tow, and he was able to catch great views of both the black and the green. Indeed, as a result of these childhood experiences, he came to see Hales Owen and the Clents as that debatable no man's land being fought over by the forces of industrialization and mother nature. Next slide. Brett Young himself said that, in my childhood, Hales Owen seemed the most romantic place, and it later became the groundwork for his black country novels, and truthfully, all of his novels, for he declared that it was from the summits of both Clent Hills that he could see all of my literary territory. Next slide. The central feature of Halesby is its church, and it is that structure I will focus upon here as many of Brett Young's portrayals of the town focus upon it primarily. It is inspired by Hales Owen Church of St John the Baptist, of Halesby's church, Brett Young writes. To begin with, the parish church of Halesby was a structure of great beauty. Originally an offshoot of the abbey, 
that now stood in ruins a lot above the long string of slowly silting fish ponds on the stoa. The grace and ingenuity of successive ages of priestly architects had embellished its original design with many beautiful features and the slender beauty of its spire, crowning a steep bank above the degraded river, had imposed an atmosphere of dignity and rest upon the rather squalid surroundings of this last of the black country towns. The attention to actual historical detail in this pen portrait of Halsby Church is breathtaking. Mention is made of the abbey that stood in ruins, a clear reference to the ruins of Halsdow in Priory, formerly the monastery of St Mary, but now lie in an inaccessible field just off the A456. Halesby Church differs, however, from Howes Owen's actual church in that it was a Norman church that stood on the site of an even older Anglo-Saxon church, preceding the Priory, not being an offshoot of it. Most of what remains today comes from the late medieval age, and the church's edifice was restored by the Victorians, speaking to the grace and ingenuity of successive ages the Brett Young writes of. Such architecture and the pre-industrial age are revered by Brett Young, and his disappointment that this industry has begun reaching Hales Owen by the late 19th century, with this passage from the young physician being set around 1898, becomes very clear in its closing lines. Dignity, rest, and something of splendour was endowed upon Halesby by its parish church. Industrialisation had turned the town into one of rather squalid surroundings, however. And finally, Halesby, last of the black country towns, had fallen to the Industrial Revolution, and instead of remaining a small town in its own right, it had been subsumed by the might of the revolution's cancer. Next slide. One other fact proves that Brett Young's depiction of Halesby Church is quite true to its original inspiration, and that fact is to be found in its graveyard. There lie the remains of two individuals who, to varying degrees, held a major importance in Brett Young's early years. One of those individuals was his literary forebear, William Shenston, the famous poet and landscape gardener who had quite literally transformed some of Hales Owen's landscape when he began crafting the Lisos. We learn in The Young Physician that Shenston was indeed buried in Halesby churchyard in the canon of Brett Young's novels, but in another part of the churchyard and not in the urn that claimed to hold his ashes. Shenston's grave had, by 1898, been elbowed almost in the path by that of a Victorian ironmonger, showing once again that the majestic and rural past of Halesby had been shunned by the industrial age that succeeded it. The second individual of importance buried in Halesby was Brett Young's mother. Her literary counterpart, Edwin Ingleby's mother, Edwin Ingleby being the protagonist of The Young Physician, was also buried in Halesby Churchyard during the very early chapters of his own novel. Change slide. If we travel further down the River Stoa and towards the River Severn, we arrive at Morn, which is based on Horn, now a suburb of Hales Owen, but originally a town in its own right. As Jacques Leclerc points out, the image Francis Brett Young has of Horn was again one drawn primarily from his childhood. It is dominated by the new British ironworks, which owned Hall Colliery, went bankrupt in 1890 and was directed, in part at least, by one of his grandfathers who resided at Old Horn Hall. In Morn, we find the industrialist Walter Willis, who is the owner of the Great Morn Furnaces and Great Morn Iron and Steel Company, the latter of which verges on financial collapse in 1914 until it is saved from destruction by the outbreak of the First World War. Willis himself resides in Morn Hall, the story of Willis and his flirting cyclically with success and failure is clearly based on the experiences of Brett Young's grandfather and their respective industrial businesses suffer from very similar fates and fortunes in the grander scheme of things. Although the Great Morn Iron and Steel Company survived significantly longer than the new British Iron Works, it does not exist long after the close of the Great War in 1918. Change slide. 
In the Iron Age, we are able to follow the expansion of the Morn plant from the waging of the Franco-Prussian War in 1870 and 1871. As Morn fuels the battles of that conflict with the material of increasingly total war, it is soon discovered that the existing works in the town are not large enough. A new factory was needed, brick to build it, money to float it. Abraham Hackett, one of the Holloway, had the brickyards and the money. Old Mr Willis, who hated him like poison, gave him a partnership. The fact Willis despises Hackett, but still chooses to unite with him, demonstrates how distastefully Brett Young viewed the industrialists of the black country. Personal feelings are put aside so their own respective strengths can be combined to allow for the construction of more factories, for the meeting of greater demands, and for the unfathomable and for unfathomable sorry, for unfathomable there we go, amounts of money to be made. But while the fortunes of Walter Willis are on the rise, those of the natural world are faltering. Mon becomes an industrial centre. No more of a little world it was before the Franco-Prussian War, and the tentacles of its industry slowly snake their way down the Stour Valley, invading its formerly green borderlands and turning them black. It is a very sorry thought, as Brett Young, here as elsewhere, makes clear. Next slide. If we continue moving westwards down the Stour, we eventually arrive at the two towns which take the waterway's name as its own, Stowerton and Stowerford. The first roughly corresponds to Stowerbridge. It is interesting to note, however, that there is no mention of the glassmaking industry in Brett Young's novels. Part of this could be due to the fact that glassmaking was less centred on Stowerbridge itself and more focused upon the towns of Worsley and Amblecote. As these towns are not explicitly featured in his Black Country portrait, we seemingly find excuse for the lack of glassmaking in his novels. There was nothing preventing Brett Young from making Stowerton a composite town that comprised all three of these towns. The reason Stowerton is so underdeveloped in comparison to the representations of Hales being Morn, and therefore um, it is simply because the town is not particularly important to the plots of Brett Young's novels. Therefore, it is only used to further flesh out the portrait of a black country comprising several towns with their own individual character. The only continually mentioned part of Stowerton is its railway station, Stowerton Junction, which speaks to the importance of the railway system in Britain. People may, and did, and still do, travel through towns purely by dint of the fact that they are travelling to another. And the experience many have of Stowbridge today is the interchange at Stowbridge Junction when alighting one train and catching another, or using the light railway to access the bus station before travelling elsewhere. Many of his characters, Claire Hinston of Portrait of Claire included, similarly do not experience much of the town outside of its station platforms. Change slide. Stowerford, on the other hand, stands in for Hagley with its only notable feature, Stowerford Castle, becoming the, the fictional equivalent of Hagley Hall. Francis Brett Young was a personal friend of Lord Cobham's and visited Hagley Hall on several occasions. Stowerford Castle is very interesting in that it does not tell us much about the actual Hagley Hall it is intended to stand in for. If anything, it is actually a reflection of its inhabitants. The castle is the seat of Sir Joseph Hinston, an ironmaster who makes his fortunes from works located in the northern part of the Black Country, particularly Wolverbury. Also living there is his wife, Lady Hinston, a vile, venomous woman who is deplorable exactly because she pretends to be something that she is not, a member of the landed gentry. Stowerford's a sham, we learn from Ralph Hinston in Portrait of Care and so are his parents, Sir and Lady Hinston. Next slide. Oh, next slide again, sorry, Chris. But there is one event in the history of Stourford Castle that takes heavy inspiration from real life events. During the course of the First World War, a bomb dropped by a Zeppelin lands in the grounds of the castle. 
One of them Zepps, Bissell excitedly informed her next morning. I reckon he must have stayed by the furnaces at morn. A pretty old mess, they say, is made there. And then he dumped the stuff that he'd got left at Stowerford. They say there's a hole in the park you could put a house in. The hole, which you could put a house in, gaped in the park a hundred yards from the front of the doorsteps. Lady Hinchton was contemplating it triumphantly when she arrived. She seemed to consider it as a signal compliment to the importance of Stairford, as if it had been a telegram from the Kaiser himself. Of course it was deliberate, she maintained. The Germans realised that Wolverbury's a thorn in their side. 500 tonnes of shells in a single month go from our works. They probably knew, as well, that we intended to turn Stairford into a hospital. Now, equating this with the historical reality of events, we know that Brett Young is taking a considerable amount of creative license. Next slide. The actual bombing of the Black Country occurred on the night of the 31st of January and 1st of February 1916, and it was carried out by two Zeppelins, L-21 and L-19. L-21 arrived over the area first, bombing Dudley, Tipton, Bradley, Wensbury and Warsaw. When L-19 followed a few hours later, she dropped bombs on Blackheath, Wensbury, Ocker Hill, Dudley, Tipton Green, and again, Warsaw. In Portrait of Clare, however, we read that the bombing on the Black Country occurred shortly after the Germans had retreated from the Marne to the Ain, which happened in September 1914, a full year and a half before the actual Zeppelin raid occurred. There is also no mention of Wensford or Dalston being bombed. So Brett Young's most obvious novelistic equivalents escaped the Zeppelin menace. But we do find that Morn and Stowerford bore the brunt of the attack, despite the fact that neither Hales Owen, Horn, nor Hagley Hall had bombs dropped on them in reality. But this alteration of facts should not be seen as an issue. Brett Young provides his reader with an intimate, better idea of the black country's experience of the war and though it is a general one which is not true to the history books it is one which creates a sense of the horror which must have been felt by the residents of the region who experienced the bombing raid in 1916. In addition Brett Young's inclusion of the raid in Portrait of Clare as well as several other novels indicates that he was taking cues from the actual course of history meaning that there is something to be taken away from his books in terms of understanding the historical context behind them. Next slide. Lady Hinston is made out to be a figure of hate, later referring to the attack as being made by our Zeppelins, taking away from the more general suffering that was experienced by many during the war. Her insistence that the bomb was dropped because the Germans realised that Wolverbury's a thorn in their side is more important, perhaps. The black country did play a crucial role during the First World War, producing a great deal of war material for the numerous fronts that Britain was fighting on, including munitions, gun components, automotive machinery, and some of the first tanks ever used in history. The note that Hinchton's factory is producing 500 tonnes of shell in a single month speaks to this historical truth. But the bombing of Stowerford Castle is more significant. It is demonstrative of the fact that not only was the black country producing the weapons of war and getting rich from it, but that it also, in doing so, had become a legitimate victim of war. During the First World War, hubris gave way to nemesis. Change slide. As Sir Joseph Hinchton's works were primarily located in Wolverbury, it makes sense for us to jump to this northern expanse of the black country next. As already mentioned, Brett Young wrote that Wolverbury was not quite Wolverhampton. Its location in his black country does roughly correspond to the true positioning of Wolverhampton, and it clearly takes inspiration from the town in its name. In White Ladies, however, we learn of some of the industries that are functioning in Wolverbury during the 19th century, and these industries make the portrait of this town more complex. Next slide. 
As the British Isles desperately did its best to foil the imperialistic intentions of Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte, the black country was whipped up into a previously unseen fervour as it did its absolute best to supply the nation with the weapons of war that it needed. In Wolverbury, we learn that at least 10,000 Londoners made cast iron bits and stirrups and Sadler's ironmongery, all key components for the kitting out of a war horse. Such industries were in reality located in Wolverhampton, but they were mostly centred upon the town of Warsaw. Now, the town of Warsaw does not directly appear in Brett Young's portrait of the black country, but that it seems to have influenced his creation of Wolverbury is a good demonstration of how General Brett Young intended his depiction of the black country to be, change slide. It was so general, in fact, that the boundaries between Wolverhampton and Warsaw are blurred, and the leather industry in particular can be placed inside a town that isn't quite Wolverhampton and possibly somewhat Warsaw, change slide. In Portrait of Clare, we see Wolverbury more closely than we do in White Ladies, and this time it is just before and during the First World War. In this appearance, we see through Brett Young's characterisation of the town exactly how he viewed industry, but also the role it played during the war in an incredibly industrial light, and negative light, sorry. At first, we join Stephen Hinston, the son of Claire and her first husband, Ralph, as he visits Wolverbury to be guided in the world of iron mastery by his grandfather, Sir Joseph Hinston of Stourford Castle. For three days on end, he wandered over that city of steelworks, ravished by opening vistas of mechanical efficiency and power. In a high crow's nest among the blackened girders of the Ford roof, he pressed an electric button that bade the smooth arm of a hydraulic press descend and saw the shaft of an Atlantic liner squeezed and moulded like butter 40 feet below him. He was the Iron Master, the master of iron, with the power of many thousand horses in his fingertips. And, as he hung there, like a divinity in skied, iron and the romance of iron entered into his soul. These machines are truly monstrous. To squeeze and mould the hull of a ship as if the steel was butter is indicative of just how powerful these machines actually were. Stephen is briefly given a feeling of omnipotence, becoming a god of industry, the master of iron, with the power of many thousand horses in his fingertips. But this is only an illusion. He is not the master of the machine. The machine masters him and only appears to have been tamed by him. Change slide. Human life counts very little next to the working of Walbury's forges, as we learn bitterly after George Hinston, the eldest son of Sir Joseph Hinston, is blown to pieces on the opening day of the Battle of the Somme in 1916. The factories do not stop, as it needed more than the death of a Hinston to stay their functioning, to check the gigantic inertia, to break a rhythm which, once established, seemed as little amenable to human interference as the war itself. Even the death of Sir Joseph Hinston's hair cannot still the machines of his ironworks. There is no time to stop when there is money to be made. And even then, Brett Young gives the impression that it would be impossible to sequester such a monster anyway. Human life is secondary, if even of any significance, destined to remain in the shadows of the forges, steam hammers, chimneys and smoke of the black country. Brett Young wants his readers to view the war as inhumane, the very way that he saw it. Let us not forget that he did serve in the First World War himself. And the black country, in almost refusing to care about the loss of anybody, regardless of their significance or social standing, is equally as inhumane as the war itself. Wolverbury is the realisation of this strain of Brett Young's thinking. Change slide. The insignificance of human life again comes to the fore in Brett Young's portrayal of Wensford, 
But here he criticises more heavily the social conditions that came with industrialisation. Wensford was a composite black country town, but its name recalls Wensbury primarily and Wensfield to a lesser extent. And it is situated in more or less the same place as the former. Wensbury is a town located near the very centre of the black country and is today located within the borough of Sandwell, meaning it is Brett Young only for Ray into the region. But, of course, to argue this any further would be to impose modern boundaries onto a past in which they simply did not exist. Wensbury was a town in its own right, famous for the production, above all, of tubes. Its name derives from Woden, the Norse god, implying that the area's earliest inhabitants worshipped this deity. It is nice, I think, that Brett Young remained true for this in naming his version of a black country town, no matter how large the role Wensbury played in actually inspiring him. Inspiring him. Do forgive me. Change slide, sorry, Chris. It is in my brother Jonathan that Wensford is most heavily developed. In this novel, we follow the protagonist, Dr. Jonathan Dakers, as he takes up a general practice in Wensford, destined to be his home for the rest of his life. As he steps off the train and walks through the town, he reflects upon what he sees around him. Its railway station had been built there 50 years before, where the desert, if no longer green, was still alive, and Wensford itself a village, already half debased, yet breathing still the air of the pleasant fields beyond. A gracious village it must have been, Jonathan thought, as he carried his bag down the station steps and saw, within the circle of new buildings whose staring yellow bricks were already grimed with soot, a definable nucleus of red-tiled roofs and a graceful perpendicular church tower of grey sandstone. A new road, metalled and edged with blue brick pavement, had been driven straight as an arrow from the station into the heart of the old village, its course defined by two uniform rows of workmen's houses that rose on either side like the walls of a culvert. Among these, breaking the monotony with an ornateness that was just as offensive, stood two public buildings faced with terracotta, a police station and a cottage hospital, whose size suggested that Wensford, humble though it might be, did not lag behind its more important neighbours in crime or in disease. This is a lovely, if somewhat damning description of the black country town. Through the thoughts of Jonathan, Brett Young channels his own preference for the rural past and dislike of the industrial present. Half a century before, he imagines, Wensford was a village, one already forging ahead and taking up the new industrial possibilities offered by the age of steam and machines, but one still able to breathe happily, taking in the air of the pleasant fields beyond. It is clear Jonathan implies, by the size of the imposing police station and the cottage hospital, the crime and disease are rife in Wensford, and he soon learns for himself that the, least, that the latter, at least, is true. The people of Wensford, then, are shown to be lacking, unhealthy, uncivilised, and more or less heathen, unfit, unfitting, given its namesake. The greatest crime, however, is not committed by any one individual, it is that of the great industrialists who have turned this once peaceful, almost green village into one choking on its own fumes. Next. We later discover in Mr. Luckton's freedom that the industry in Wensford continued to expand unabated. In that novel, Owen Luckton, the protagonist, meets the rambler Hubert Bert Hopkins during his brief period of ultimate freedom. Bert works at the Wensford Amalgamated Ironworks, which Jacques Leclerc argues is almost certainly ext an extension of the Wensford Steel Company that had already been mentioned in the Iron Age. This indicates that the town's industry is still going strong on the eve of the Second World War in 1939. Next. The town of Dulston also plays a role in Brett Young's Black Country, but it is a minor one. And it is significant mostly because it adds more flesh to his portrait of the region. Very rarely in the novels does Dulston turn up. 
It only appears at any great length in the Black Diamond, Cold Harbour and Far Forest. And in two of those, it is while the characters are attending the Dalston Wake, held annually in the grounds of that town's medieval castle. It is the castle above all, and the name secondly, which shows that Dalston is Brett Young's own version of Dudley, although the latter part of its name takes inspiration from both Bilston and Tipton. Dudley itself held wakes in the ground of De Bruyne Castle, and in 1951 held a poorly received pageant for the Festival of Britain on the very same spot, but its wakes do differ slightly from their real-world equivalents. In the novels, Dalston's wakes are held on a bank holiday in August, whereas in Dudley they occurred in late September. But this is only trivial. Even if Dalston appears very rarely, it is still clear that Brett Young took inspiration from the real black country. Next. The last town we will look at is Sedgebury, which is quite clearly inspired by Sedgley. Sedgley lies upon the highest parts of the black country's watershed, and it commands great views of the area around it. To the west, Shropshire, the Welsh marches, and deeper into Wales itself. To the east, the rest of the black country it was destined to be encroached upon by. Similarly, Sedgbury was located atop the Sedgbury Ridge and commanded equally as fascinating views. Next slide. John Bradley experiences the following. He walked beyond the last of the Nailers' cottages and onto the narrowest part of the ridge, the point from which, nearly a year ago, he had first seen the Cleese. Above, in a still, clear sky, shone myriads of frosty stars which seemed nearer to earth and more brilliant than usual. To westward stretched a great void in which neither a glimmer of light nor the vaguest of forms could be seen. The dark undulations of sear fields and sapless woodlands rolling away to the Valley of Severn, the Forest of Werewood, the Border Hills. But to eastward, beneath the stationary pall of smoke that hung in the upper air and veiled the true stars, the basin of the black country lay like a low sky set within its own constellations. Coruscations of colliery spoil heaps that smouldered invisibly by day but now twinkled brightly. Brickyard ovens and lime kilns, whose banked fires burned dull red with a steadier planetary glow. Tailed comets of flaming vapour that suddenly flared from the throats of blast furnaces and were spent. Moving like good trains that slid dreamily like meteorites through the empty spaces which separated the dense nebulae that marked the street lights of small towns such as Dalston. Wensford and Wolverbury, far away on the northern horizon, the greater galaxy of North Bromwich itself. North Bromwich, I don't think I've mentioned, stands in for Birmingham in Brett Young's novels. The exact same views commanded from atop Sedgley's Beacon Hill are visible from the fictional extremes of Sedgbury's Ridge. The green country of Worcestershire clustering around the River Severn the forest of Wherewood, and the hills that litter the border between England and Wales, all can be seen to the east and are viewed with nostalgia by Brett Young through the mind of John Bradley. This was the country he loved and to which he truly belonged. But the country he harked from was that lying to the east. This is an interesting depiction of the black country by Brett Young. It appears beautiful and he describes it by comparing it to the night sky. The difference is that, whereas the night sky was clearly visible to the west, in the east it was replaced by the collieries, furnaces, brickyards, lime kilns, chimneys and trains that populated the black country, all allowing the lights of their respective fires to illuminate not the night sky above them, but the deep, dark, smoky pallor that continually hangs above the region. This vision, this vision of magnificence is only temporary, however. Given Brett Young's more blatant criticisms of the black country and its industrialisation elsewhere, we only momentarily lapse into this sense of wonder. The destruction of nature and humankind is too much to forgive the region, even for such spectacles as this. 
that he otherwise portrays the black country as a cancer constantly thrusting its tentacles in the hope of disease in the green borderland surrounding it should never be too far in the back of the reader's mind. Next slide. Lastly, however, I must turn to the dominant feature of Sedgbury, one which represents one of the most characteristic features of the black country during its industrial age. This is the Sedgbury main colliery. The master engineer behind the colliery, Humphrey Furnival, is nothing short of a genius, but he is an industrialist who, more than any other of Brett Young's characters, bears the full brunt of nature striking back. The Sedgbury pit is one of the best equipped ever constructed in the black country, and from the outset it promises to produce immense amounts of coal and money. Many residents of the black country and its immediate surroundings put money behind the scheme, but though they hope to gain, they all soon lose everything. Disaster strikes when the mine is flooded. Around 30 miners are drowned, although the figure changes in different novels. Hundreds of people are financially ruined and the pit becomes irredeemable, beyond saving, and the genius of Furnival comes to absolutely nothing. The disaster was based off the actual flooding of a colliery in Horn and brings to mind many true accounts of horrifying pit disasters, particularly that at Pelsall Colliery in 1872, which cost the lives of 22 men and boys. Next slide. We learn in Portrait of Claire that the disaster was not so much a catastrophe as a crime. Experienced miners had warned the management that they were on dangerous ground, the villain of the piece, that callous megalomaniac Furnival, a man who gambled with lives as his victims gambled with pence. The magnitude of the disaster had been exaggerated by the directors, who were already secretly buying up the depreciated shares. The magnitude of the disaster had been concealed by those same directors for fear of arousing the righteous indignation that they deserved. The roll of casualties reached fantastic figures that swung upwards and downwards like a barometer in a typhoon. It was a crime, Brett Young insists, with the greedy likes of Furnival and his fellow industrialists, including Walter Willis and Sir Joseph Hinchton, hoping to make great fortunes out of the Collier's success. But they had not considered the ultimate power of all, a power which, though they may try their best to tame, dominate and keep well and truly trampled underfoot, could never possibly be well and truly defeated. This power is, of course, Mother Nature. No matter how modern a colliery was, disaster could easily befall it, and that was exactly the case with the Sedgbury Main. Afterwards known as Farvelous Bairn, it stands in the novels as a cruel reminder of exactly where the black country's hubris in doing its best to turn the green land of England black was going to get it. In having the Sedgbury Main colliery destroyed, and with it many hopeful and somewhat spiteful residents of the black country, Francis Brett Young makes it clear that the onward charge of industry characterised fully and most forcibly by the black country, will eventually falter in the face of the green. It is this message that Brett Young wants, above all, to bestow upon his readers. Nature will eventually win. Next slide. And so there we have it. A portrait of the black country, as viewed through the lens of Francis Brett Young's novels and the prejudices and beliefs that he tries to filter through them. This has certainly been a very quick survey, only scratching the surface. Much more time could be spent fully picking apart every single industry and company located in each of his black country towns, or hours spent investigating the lives of every single named character who traverses its landscape. Francis Brett Young's black country does not exist alone in his novels either, much as the real-life region doesn't. The relationship for this fictional black country has with his versions of Birmingham, Worcestershire, the Welsh Marches, London, Capri, and even South Africa could be discussed in much more depth, especially because these relationships used as a groundwork their creators' very own understandings of them. Truthfully, 
This survey of Brett Young's black country has been quite general, but in being so, it is more in line with Brett Young's own portrait of the region. A general one that gives us a good flavour of what life was like during the industrial age of the area, and one through which still allows for his inspirations and his own personal beliefs, preferences and prejudices to shine through. James Lloyd. After leaving the black country in his early years, Brett Young never returned. Following the First World War and his general practice in Brixham, he lived during different periods in Capri, the Lake District, South Africa, which is where he eventually died, and most significantly at all, in his preferred homeland, Worcestershire. If we were able to commune with the author for this minute and ask him for his opinions on this subject, he would certainly assure us that Hales Owen truly belonged to Worcestershire, not the black country, and that it was this county that he also belonged to. Crankham House was his most beloved residence, and it is in Worcester, Worcester Cathedral sorry, that, following his death and cremation in 1954, his ashes were interned. There he has a memorial plaque and his ashes share with the cathedral, one of a man who, like himself, adored Worcestershire and allowed his love of this rural, majestic land to influence his own understanding of the world. Prime Minister Stanley Baldwin. Industry held no special place in Francis Brett Young's heart. It was nature that won in the end, after all. Chan Lloyd. But his importance to the black country should never be forgotten. He despised the industry that sprung up from the material rich basin. From the outset, he disliked the destruction and despoilation that the Industrial Revolution had raked upon this once green land and was attempting to grow outward into other natural havens. But he did not denigrate the black country people. As we have seen, he felt for the population of the industrial basin, viewing them with his physician's spectacles on and being disheartened by the very fact the age of steam and machinery had enslaved this race and depressed any hope of individuality they had. But in a speech he gave to Briley Hill in 1940, he declared that the England for which I feel most tenderly is that part of the country in which I was born the black country. It may not be particularly beautiful. We do not claim that for it. But we can say that the black country is the very heart of England and that the people who inhabit it and speak its language are the soundest, kindliest and toughest to be found in this island. The black country is the heart of England, not because of its industrial prowess, or the fact it pumped the British Empire in further afield with a myriad of items produced by its varied, wide-ranging industries. It was the heart because the people were innately good. Although his novels indicate the population of the black country had been enslaved by the machinery that found a fitting home waiting for it in that mineral-laden land, they were, in the author's non-literary eyes, tough enough to break those shackles allowing them to be the soundest and kindly, kindliest in the British Isles. So yes, Brett Young hated industry and the ravages it brought with it, and he also saw his true home as Worcestershire, but he never forgot his roots. Next slide. I will close with a remark made by the public orator Thomas Bodkin in 1950. The occasion in question was Brett Young's endowment with an honorary degree from his own and my own university, the University of Birmingham. Bodkin declared that he has done for Warwickshire and Worcestershire what Hardy did for Dorset and Arnold Bennett for the five towns. You are now asked to acclaim the most accomplished author whom the university has yet produced and one whose fame is likely to be soon enhanced by the publication of another book in praise of the Dominion of Africa, and better still, of another novel about the Midlands of England. Brett Young remains one of the most acclaimed authors that the university has ever produced, and although he is somewhat forgotten there, his portrait, 
painted in 1922 by Kathleen Mann, now hangs in one of the libraries of the medical school, a fitting location for it, even though I wasn't allowed to view it when I was at the university because I wasn't a medical student. As Bodkin notes, Brett Young certainly did for Worcestershire and Warwickshire what his literary forebears, the great Hardy and Bennett, had done for their own native regions. To that, I would add Brett Young's own native region, the Black Country. So thank you very much, everybody. If you'd like to change this final slide for me, Chris. So thank you for listening. I appreciate it. And apologies for slipping up so often. I am now stopping the share. Uh, thank you, Jack. Can people see, see me and Jack again? Um, if we've got any points to, that you'd like to put to Jack, could you put them into the chat, please? And Andrew will... Uh, and Andrew will uh, try and collate them. Um, there's some coming. Can I, I just start off while they're coming in? I was fascinated to see how he combined towns and uh, changed names and things. The one thing that struck me was what you called Stourton. Uh, there is a village that I would call Stourton, uh, which is actually where the Stupony Inn was on the edge of, edge of the Black Country. Uh, and so there's that's perhaps the only name that is actually real, but it doesn't correspond to where it was. Yes, I am aware of it, um, but it is, I've always pronounced it Stereton, maybe I'm wrong, but um, it is the only name, and because I've noticed this before, that he has lifted and seemingly placed elsewhere, but it isn't the same Stereton or Stereton that you cool. know of with the Stupony. It is absolutely Stereobridge, and we can tell that because of, Stereton um, Junction, which is recognisably Stereobridge yeah. Junction. Yeah. Andrew, is there other things there? You're frozen, Andrew. That's it. Could you unmute yourself, Andrew, please? Andrew, could you unmute yourself? There we go. Sorry about we can that. Hear you. <laughs> it was fascinating, Jack. Thank you. Thank you. Thank um, you like uh, like your colleagues at the Black Country Living Museum, um, didn't know much about Francis Brett Young. Um, my father, though, uh, Winston Homer, found a member of the society, as some people here may well know. Um, he he was a great fan of Francis Brett Young and belonged to the Francis Brett Young Society. I don't know whether that's still still going or not. Um, it is still it might, going. It might be. Ah, I, I know that is, Jack um, went to the Francis Brett Young Society lunch today. Indeed, it is why I'm wearing a tie. I've been to their annual dinner today. Oh, it right. is still going strong. Um, they have members from four four different continents. But that's all they admit. But um, it is still going strong, and I think they're very happy to have me as well. <laughs> oh, it's good to know your father was also a member. That's, that's great that it's still still going. Um, it, it, for um, Black Country Society members on here, if they're interested, um, you've got free access to the uh, the archive of um, the Black Countryman magazines. I believe. Uh, I haven't looked recently, but I believe it's in the very first issue. Um, my father wrote a, an article called Two Gentlemen of Yells. Um, as Jack, I'm sure, will know, uh, uh, Yells is the old name, nickname for uh, Hal Zoen. Um, one of those gentlemen being William Shenston, who you mentioned in your talk, and the other one, of course, being uh, Francis Brett Young. So that's there if anyone's interested. I do believe, Jack, that I've seen um, a Will's coloured postcard, sorry, cigarette card of Francis Brett Young. Um, not a That's correct, that. yes. Ah, there, there is such a thing. I, there I'm is, yes. <laughs> Thought of, <laughs> no, it I'm not sure what I've seen. I, I know I've seen one somewhere. <laughs> oh, we're, we're, uh, we're getting um, getting some thanks through. Um, Steve, Steve Pottinger says, uh, that was a fascinating talk, Jack. Thank you so much. And um, his question is, are Francis Brett Young's novels still in print and available? OK, so thank you very much. Firstly, Steve, I appreciate the um, compliments and it's good to hear from you. Um, are they still in print? No. Are they still available? Yes. 
Um, going back to the Francis Brett Young Society, if you got in touch with them, they'd be happy to um, send you copies of the books you need. Dave, I think Michael Hall, who's our chairman, was saying he's got at least 300 Brett Young novels in his garage, and he only published 30. So <laughs> he's got quite a few copies, so they are available. Um, you'll also see them sprout up in charity shops. I've been told he's still incredibly popular in South Africa. Well, that's probably no use to you. But um, you can get them in charity shops littered around the region. Um, I'd be happy to lend you copies of the books I've got as well, Steve. That's no issue um, at all. Excuse me, Jack, uh, if you don't mind butting in. Do you happen to know if the books are public domain yet or not? He is currently about to enter public domain. I think, yes, it's next year because he died in 1954. So I believe it's next year Francis Brett Young enters public domain. And that happens, um, a lot of them might be able to be downloaded for free from Google Books. That would, um, be, that would be delightful but, uh, to get yeah. more people involved. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, George. Uh, Susan, Susan Heath um, says, many thanks, Jack, for a fascinating talk. Um, Jeff Taylor-Smith, uh, Jack, from your research, do you think that FBY follows the tradition of romanticism and sense of loss for a rural idyll as characterised by Eliot, Wordsworth and Hardy? Um, absolutely. It's very, you've got to be careful when saying that they absolutely fall into a certain tradition because traditions, the, their boundaries are so fluid and, you know, easily crossed. But Brett Young is certainly romantic in viewing the countryside, particularly that of Worcestershire and into the Welsh marches. Um, he's not as romantic as Hardy, I would say, but at the same time, he's not as brutal as Hardy. A lot of Hardy's characters suffer terrible fates on account of the fact that's just nature in this post-Darwinian world. Whereas Brett Young's characters their fights all seem to rest upon the world around them. So it is romantic in that normally, if they're in the Black Country or to a lesser extent North Bromwich, which is Brett Young's Birmingham, due to their oppressive atmospheres, um, the characters suffer badly. Whereas if the characters move westwards towards the River Severn into Worcestershire, Shropshire, and the Welsh Marches and beyond, the Black Mountain included, um, they're better, they're healthier, they're happier, they have freedom. Um, so I would say in that regard that Brett Young is certainly romantic, but I wouldn't say as romantic, certainly not as hardy. Wordsworth's a different kettle of fish because um, I think he's, he's beautiful and he's obviously in love with the light district. But poetry, I think it's always hard to um, crack the meanings behind poetry in terms of where people fall traditionally. But yes, certainly I think... Brett Young, definitely a romantic, lowercase r <laughs> I guess that sense of a, a rural idyll can be seen in um, Shenston's design of Lisos. I think that was oh, possibly absolutely. Shenston, wasn't it? Which is the yeah. same area as uh, Sir Francis Brett Young. Was, well, exactly. Uh, was the, um, the only difference is Shenston's got a Weatherspoon's pub named after him. Brett Young is yet to have that. <laughs> Perhaps there ought to be a beer named after him. <laughs> uh, Pete, Peter, uh, no second name listed. Uh, oh, it's just jumped. Hang on, bear with me a second. Sorry about that, it just jumped. Um, I've noted that Epsom College, which is very proud of its alumni, makes no mention of Francis Brett Young. Which is a shame. Um, as I say, though, um, Birmingham, the University of Birmingham makes no big hullabaloo about Brett Young. There's no blue plaques to him, but there are blue plaques to other individuals. In their relatively new library, there is a portrait of David Lodge, which is a fantastic portrait because it's a portrait of David Lodge sat next to a portrait of David Lodge. Um, but there's, as I say, there's the, por the portrait by Kathleen Mann in the um, university, uh, sorry, medical school, but no portrait to him at the University of Birmingham. So it's also a shame to hear that it's the same at Epsom College. Um, why? Is it because he perhaps wasn't that important to that side of Britain, more focused upon 
Uh, and Birmingham, the black country, Worcestershire, as I say. Is it just because they don't see anything of it? He is incredibly forgotten, as I say. But whatever the reason behind it, it's a massive shame. And I'm glad someone's pointed that out to me because I wasn't aware of it. Uh, Gloria has pointed out that um, presumably one of his books, The Crescent Moon, is available on Kindle. Amazon Kindle, that would be. Apparently. It will, yes. Um, she doesn't give a price, so I don't know whether that's <laughs> free 199p or... Uh, or or dearer. Uh, Brian Brian Bailey says thank you for an exceptional talk, Jack. I greatly enjoyed it, and it was obviously intricately researched. You mentioned the sympathy with which Brett Young seemed to view the people of the or indeed his black country. Putting you rather on the spot, could you name the most sympathetic character from a Brett Young work? which you believe embodies the everyman of the black country, if indeed one exists. Absolutely. Um, the, the everyman is Abner Fellows, who is the protagonist of The Black Diamond, published in 1921. Um, he's, he's living in Halesby with his father. Um, his father remarries. Um, tension between his father and also his stepmother arrives. So he then decides to move on and he walks through Worcestershire into the Welsh marches, living in areas that Brett Young called Chapel Green, Mainstone, Wolf Pits. He's a working man. He worked down the mine, down pit. Um, and he was absolutely the most down to earth person who he had his wits about him, but he wasn't the sharpest folk. And he was absolutely victim to what was happening around him. So in that case, I'd say he's an everyman in that he's not changing the world, but the world is changing him. Um, so I'd, abs I'd absolutely say it's Abner Fellows from the, um, the Black Diamond, who is his most working class protagonist of all. Most of his other work, um, protagonists are more upper working class, lower middle class. Um, so I'll... Uh... I don't I haven't got a name. Uh, somebody's pointing out that there's a, a Morn Heath in Far Forest. Uh, Far Forest, is. I believe, is the other, the other side of Bewdley, for people who don't know the area too well, which I it assume is, would yes. be Worcestershire. So Far Forest is um, the other side of Bewdley. Uh, it's essentially, is it the Wire Forest? I think it's set on the Wire Forest. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it does have... Pat, um, does have Parts that are set in the Black Country. Um, the protagonist visit Dulston or Dudley for the wake. Uh, Morn Heath is featured. It's where the two protagonists are from. And it's a phenomenal portrait to the Black Country. Um, you get to see underground in the mines. So you see the pits. You hear about the pit ponies. Um, how the methods of mining were actually done. I've got to be careful here to not rephrase the commentary from the uh, mine experience at the Black Country Living Museum that's become verbatim for me, but um, you do get great um, an exploration of the Black um, the Black Country's mines. It mentions the nail shops as well, or um, the chain workers. So I think Morn Heath is an incredible portrait. It's a truly blasted, stunted area, but it has wonderful features such as a cherry orchard and a, a crescent called the Dark Half Hour, which is essentially a lover's lane. And these are like the last bastions of nature in Morn, which is now the precinct of the Black Country. It's the precinct of industrialisation. I think it's an incredibly well-researched and well-developed portrait. So thank you for that, yes. Uh, Susan Heath has uh, jumped onto Amazon for us. And the, the uh, <laughs> Kindle edition of The Crescent Moon is priced at £3.49. If anyone is interested in, uh, in getting that, not bad at all. <laughs> no, not bad at all. No, absolutely. Um, Patrick says thank you for this excellent, well-researched talk, Jack. Uh, is also pointing out that there's an exhibition by the Francis Bet Young Society at the archives in Dudley on now, uh, May, well, May to August, apparently. I must admit, I've not seen anything about that anywhere. I don't know whether anyone else has. I know it's happening, but only because the Brett Young Society have told me so much. Um, 
I intend to pop in at some point, but the only time I'm ever next to the Black Country, uh, I'm sorry, Dudley Archives, is when I'm next door in the Black Country Living Museum working. So it's always um, clashes, but it is there. I don't know what's in there, but I would recommend it to anybody who wants to learn about Brett Young and perhaps use it as a, a springboard in which to learn more about the author himself. You can always pop in in costume, Jack. Oh, I, could, I could indeed. Well, I'll catch the bus to and from work in costume. It's not <laughs> an issue for me. <laughs> uh, Colleen Humble says, thank, thank you for a very interesting talk, Jack. Can you give me some detail of Brett Young's time in South Africa? Uh, did you say that he died in South Africa? That's right. So thank you, Colleen. Um, it's good to hear from you. I hope you're well, firstly. Um, I cannot remember the names of the South African towns because he moved about a lot in South Africa. And the it's my own ignorance, really, but the blending between English names and Dutch names is too much for my small mind to compute. But he moved to South Africa primarily. He, he served, as I say, in German East Africa during the Second World War and First World War, sorry, in the Royal Army, um, Royal Ambulance Medical Corps. He then moved to South Africa after the Second World War on account of his health. He struggled to get over there um, due to the fact there was a war on. Um, it was dangerous to travel by sea. But he did get to South Africa after the war. They, he uh, moved about, as I say, but he was slowly winding down. He was getting very ill. He'd been struck with malaria in the First World War and it just took a toll on him. He had a few strokes and eventually... 1954 he did pass away and he did die in South Africa um, in oh I want to say Johannesburg but don't quote me on that and then after he was cremated his ashes were taken to Britain and that's when they were um, interred in Worcester Cathedral. Adrian has pointed out well Adrian says great talk thanks Jack uh, there's apparently lots of Brett Young books available on World of Books uh, from £4.95 upwards. That's not too it's bad. I think it is good. Not too, again, not too bad, yeah. Well, a penguin paperback got, sets you back about £6.99, so... Yeah. Um, there's another question. Um, I'm not certain what it refers to. You might know, Jack. Um, what do you think of his extended description? I think, reading the chat... Um, it's split up by Bryce's comment, but it's uh, the extended description of Morn Heath in Far Forest. I think that's one question. Ah, right. That sorry. Split. Right. right. Okay. And... and I think that's it. I think that's all the uh, all the questions. Okay, thank you. Questions um, and uh, the I've just received an email too from Valerie Whiteman saying thank you for an in interesting and informative talk. Jack, uh, very um, kind. Thank you to the society society email account. Oh, so, and Jack, uh, Jeff Taylor Smith has just said thanks, Jack. Okay, brilliant. Oh, Excellent presentation. Thank you, Jeff. Uh -huh. and thank you thank, all. Thank you indeed for that. Uh, I have to say, I was somewhat disturbed in a previous life. I was one of the public orators at the university in Birmingham, <laughs> and to suddenly have public orators' words from 50, 60, 70 years ago quoted makes me somewhat nervous, I have to say, <laughs> <laughs> about what someone might do to me at some point. Um, uh, but thank you. Um, there's another couple coming in. And Andrew, do you want to... Yes, I've just, just spotted them. Um, uh, user, not sure who it is, but th thanks, very good, Jack. And uh, our own Emma Purse House, editor of our magazine. Brilliant. Thanks, Jack. Sorry I was late coming in. That's all right, everyone. Well, thank you for joining. Much appreciated. Can I say all. Thank you. Thank you to all of you. Thank you to Jack in particular. Uh, I'd ask you to show appreciation if we could in a normal way, but it doesn't seem wholly appropriate uh, <laughs> to do it this uh, when we're online. Uh, thank you for joining. I hope you've enjoyed the evening. Uh, as I said, the recordings from the previous three meetings will be online very shortly indeed. Um, there'll be a recording from this meeting uh, that will be made available to society members in the next few days, as George has produced it, and it will go public after about a month. Uh, and you should get notification of that. 
Uh, the next and final meeting of this experimental series is in a month's time on June the 14th, I think, to Wednesday in June. And there we're doing something completely different, a black country history quiz, uh, which should be quite fun. Uh, so do come along. Uh, there are, we hope, going to be prizes. Uh, I won't tell you what those prizes are. Um, but uh, I hope it will be a nice, light-hearted um, end to the series. If you can't make next time, uh, sometime after that, you'll get another email from me uh, asking you to make comments upon the whole Virtual Heritage Group programme as we review and plan for the future. But I'd like to thank you for joining this evening. Thank you to Andrew and George. And again, particular thanks to Jack. And I'm going to cut us all off there now. Thank you very much indeed. Yes, thank you, Jack. Thank you, Chris.